morning. Um, <clears throat> we continue with our series on the churches of uh, Revelation and uh, sort of preparing for this and thinking about this this week and the church of Sardis, um, if you want to turn to it, Revelation 3, 1 to 6. But the message to the church of Sardis is such a simple message, so straightforward, and there's no real having to understand it at all. And I... As I was thinking about it, I was just thinking of what does it mean um, in terms of specifically for us as individuals. And it, it is straightforward, but I think really relevant, actually. And uh, you'll know that this is the fifth church that we've looked at. And the previous four, there definitely seems to be this common picture, common theme coming through. And I suppose the church in Sardis takes that a little step further. And we have to look in terms of what that means to us today. Um, it was written to the church in Sardis at the time. Um, but we have to look at all each of these letters and, and work out what they mean for us. And Sardis was known as the dead church. And uh, I suppose that's not a title that any church would want to have. And, uh, but that's what it was known as. Um, little joke for you. Uh, someone took a heart attack in church. And the paramedics carried out five people before the guy who had taken the heart attack. <laughs> Come on, go with me. All right. You get the picture there, don't you? Everybody was dead. Um, now, I don't, uh, I'm not saying that's here. Um, please don't think that I am. Um, but the text this morning, and I'll not read it at the start because we'll be reading it as we go through this morning. Revelation 3, 1 to 6 and the... The, the church of Sardis, or the Sardinians, as they were known as. And the city of Sardis was built around 500 BC, maybe a little bit earlier than that, actually. And it was located on a narrow plateau, 1,500 feet above sea level. Because the city was built in a mountainous region, it was a natural citadel, so it was a natural fort, a fortified city. And the most prominent section of the city was the necropolis, or a cemetery of a thousand hills with a large number of burial mounds uh, visible from the city walls and the citizens were preoccupied with death. It's interesting to note that whenever you look at any of these letters to the churches in Revelation, there's a relevance in actually the, 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 the city itself to what was being taught to them. and we, That's why we look at the, this as the dead church, but these people were actually in the city were actually preoccupied with the process of death. In fact, the patron deity named Cybele was uh, believed to possess the power and ability of restoring the dead back to life. Uh, and so death was a really prominent thing in their society. And the Romans had also built a temple of the goddess Artemis uh, and a large bath gymnasium complex. And Sardis had become famous for its citizens' abilities in arts and crafts. They made lavish use of the local brightly coloured and semi-precious stones, such as fire opal and bandit agate. Their jewellery was known throughout the empire. And some historians claim that Sardis was the first city to mint coinage using gold or silver. Uh, the nearby mountains were dotted with gold mines, thus making the city the monetary capital of the region. And so in these, this region of these seven churches, and they were all in modern day Turkey, uh, was the location of what where they were. This was a very important city, uh, and it was important because of the monetary, uh, uh, the richness of the city, uh, as well as some of the some of those other cities as well. But uh, so, what does Jesus start? And you'll know uh, by talking to these churches by, and he, and you'll know that we've covered this in each of them how Jesus introduces himself to these churches, and it's very interesting as to how he does it. And Jesus starts here by saying to the angel of the church in Sardis, "Write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars." And the seven spirits of God is a very interesting concept, actually. And if you look at the book of Revelation alone, you'll see. This reference of the seven spirits of God in chapters 1, 3, 4 and 5. And it's an interesting concept. And to get our probable answer for that, we need to go back uh, to a verse in the Old Testament, Isaiah 11 and 2. And Isaiah 11 and 2 uh, 
in all likelihood uh, expands what the sevenfold spirit of God is and the Holy Spirit. And Isaiah 11 and 2 says that the spirit of the Lord will rest in him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And most New Testament scholars will believe that that is what the sevenfold spirit of God or the Holy Spirit is. So just to go through that for you again, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And Jesus introduces himself to the church here uh, by saying that he, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And again, if you remember back to some of our previous teachings on this, in all likelihood, the seven stars were the seven pastors, so the leaders of the church. So Jesus is saying, I hold the seven spirits of God. I hold the pastors in my hand. And that is the starting point of where we're at with this church and interestingly as well, when it comes to this church, Jesus starts with the condemnation. And he's right in there. There's no holding back. There's no ambiguity whatsoever. It's fairly straightforward as to what Jesus is saying here. And in verses 1 to 3, he says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. <laughs> no mixing his words here, yeah. Uh, but, and again, whenever we read this, let's not take ourselves outside of these verses because these verses are for each and every one of us. So let me read that again. I know you're dead. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. And so Jesus jumps right in. Straight away he says you have a reputation of being alive. But you are dead. And so this congregation was obviously known as a congregation that was alive. In terms of what the people of the city saw. And so there is no doubt that obviously the city must have been. Or the, the, the church in the city must have been doing good deeds. It must have had a positive impact on the people of Sardis but obviously from what Jesus is introducing here he's saying well look that was all very good but that was having no eternal impact whatsoever and I suppose whenever I started thinking about that and I'm sort of thinking in terms of congregations let, let's start off broad here and then sort of bring it down to the focus of, of us as people but it's possible, and we all probably can think of this, where congregations, where church groups actually do good deeds. And that I, I know that that's positive, by the way, and I'm not knocking that. I think it's a good thing. There's lots of church activity, particularly at this time of the year, that reaches out to people in the community. Lots of churches doing things like food hampers and, and providing clothing for people. And, and all of that is good. And this is probably what was happening in this church in Sardis where they were doing that they were reaching out but actually Jesus was saying that that okay was good but it was actually having no eternal impact and whenever I thought about that I was sort of thinking about church groups uh, potentially and again without going into specifics and I wasn't thinking about specific churches I promise you I wasn't but I know that maybe in terms of some of the new churches some of the new churches throughout the world have a big focus on social action. And again, not saying there's anything wrong with social action, but I think it has to be in the balance of what it is that we should be doing as church. And I will look at that a little bit as we get through this this morning. Is it possible that some of those churches are so focused on social action that they're not really focused on the word? They may be more interested in singing. They may be not so much interested in diving deep down into the word of God. But that's maybe not just true for some new churches. It's possible for some old congregations, old churches as well. I'm aware as well as I'm sure you're aware that there are ministers even within our own countries who aren't saved. I just can't get my head around any way anybody would want to be a minister if they weren't saved. I can't quite get my head around that because... Being a minister obviously brings some hardship in itself um, with the difficulties that that sort of presents sometimes. And I often think, why does someone waking up, uh, you know, at some point in their life, not as a Christian, 
and decide that they want to pursue a life in charge of a church. I don't understand it, but we know that that, I'm sure we all are aware of people out there who are in charge of churches who aren't saved. Uh, and obviously then they must be just providing some sort of a, a nice motivational speak on a Sunday morning potentially. I can't imagine they're challenging people because if they're not challenged themselves, not having a go at them. I'm just saying that that's a fact. And I would imagine there are many people in many of our churches right across even our own nation here and certainly across the West where they're just sitting today and they're maybe just singing a couple of songs and they're maybe just listening to some sort of a, a motivational piece. And it would be easier for us, I suppose, to look at that in terms of congregations. But we have to look at it in terms of ourselves as well because that's why these letters are written. They're written obviously to the church in Sardis, but then we have to take everything that's written in Scripture and apply it to our own circumstance and our own life. And if Jesus is saying you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead, is it possible right at the start of what we're talking about that we could have a reputation of being alive, but actually we're dead? And a reputation of being alive may well be that you know, you're busy. You could even be busy in church. You could be known as somebody who's been involved in church for many, many years. But actually, your deeds are just good deeds. They're not actually going beyond that. And it's, is it possible that there's very little maturity uh, in some of our lives? And I don't think we should just skip over that. I think we should all reflect on what Jesus is actually saying and thinking, right, okay, where am I in the midst of all of this? Because Jesus goes on to say in his next sentence, wake up. All right. You know, there's no, you know, there's no hiding from this. It's, it's a straightforward message this morning. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. So wake up. There's this opportunity that we can actually wake up because it is time to come alive. We as believers or as church congregations, need to have a real impact. We need to make a difference. If we're not going to make a difference in this world, who is going to make a difference? Because is it possible that complacency has set in to our hearts? Is it possibly the case that maybe we've just grown cold? A story is told of a soldier who uh, claimed the walls of Sardis. If you remember whenever I said there at the introduction that Sardis was that natural citadel. It was sitting on the ha on high mountains in that mountainous region and it was a natural fortified city. And the people of Sardis became quite complacent because of that. And these strong walls, these tall walls in the, on the top of these mountains made it very, very difficult to penetrate. But the story is told of a soldier climbing up the side of the, the mountain and up over the walls and getting into the unguarded city because the people of Sardis were actually quite complacent. And it was overthrown actually a couple of times uh, uh, throughout, throughout the centuries. And they thought that they were impenetrable. And I suppose is it possible that we as church can actually think that we're impenetrable? But is it the case that the church is asleep? And if it is asleep, and if you're asleep, then maybe you're going to be defeated if you don't wake up. And so Jesus says, he says, look, this may be the case. So what you need to do is you need to strengthen what remains and is about to die. If there is that small glow, if there is an ember burning in your life, you need to strengthen that. You need to feed that. You need to build upon that. You need to go back to where it was that you were. You need to strengthen what it is that you've currently got. You know, I have uh, underlined a couple of words here. And I've written it down here and it says attend church. Now, attending church is not something that will save you. Okay, that I think we'll all agree with that. Um, whether we attend church or not uh, is not relevant in terms of our justification by faith alone. However... It's an extremely important thing to do. Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. And I am aware, I'm sure you are too, of people who feel that they don't need to come to church. And I think 
if you were to go to certain countries within the world today, people have to secretly go to a location to be together. And it could cost them their lives to be together. And yet in the West, we have people who may think, do you know what, can't really be bothered today. Or do you know what, I don't really have to go. I can put on the God channel. Or I can listen to something on YouTube. And do you know what? There's nothing necessarily wrong about listening to good worship on YouTube or watching a good preacher. That's not what we're saying here. We're saying that, well, what I'm saying is I don't think that's a good substitute for actually meeting together and fellowship with God. What about reading and praying? And again, I know you maybe, you maybe heard me at this before. I know I've been saved for decades, but I know that it was only probably 10 years ago whenever I realized the importance of this. And whenever I decided, you know, this has to be some sort of a daily encounter for me because how else can you build your relationship with God? You can, you can be given out constantly and that's so easy to do as well as believers. We can be so busy for God that we don't actually know God because we're constantly maybe going through the motions, ticking the boxes, giving out, having that reputation of being alive. But actually, we're dead because we're not building upon that relationship. And it's so, so important as believers today that we give ourselves wholeheartedly to God. I've got a wee quote from the Telegraph that was... 2017 I think September 2017 sticks in my mind um, so that's only two years ago and it was a survey that was completed by the Church of England I believe but it was a survey across a variety of denominations and whenever I read this stat it was actually quite surprising but then when I thought about it I thought you know what maybe it's not so, so surprising and here's what it said figures show that 60% of self-declared followers of the church admit that they never read the Bible and 36% say that they never attend church. And one in three said that they never pray. Now, this was a widespread uh, survey that was done throughout the churches in the UK. And just to sort of break that down as simple as I can, six out of ten people admitted that they never read the Bible. Now, whenever I thought about that, I thought, you know what, actually that probably doesn't surprise me. It may have whenever I first read it, but when I thought about it, I thought, do you know what? It is possible that the Bible sits on the bedside table for a week at a time or longer. And the next one, a third of people never attend a church. And you sort of think, right, okay, probably a little bit more shocked at that one. Maybe because we come from such a religious country, potentially. This next one still shocks me one in three christians admitted to saying that they didn't pray now that one there shocks me really does because i think even people out in the world who aren't saved pray so whenever whenever i read that stat about christians one in three not admitting admitting to not praying i thought oh my goodness that there is really really serious because surely to goodness that our relationship with God has to be built on the foundation of talking to him. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a no brainer. It's not rocket science really, is it? <laughs> and, and surely to goodness then the extension of that is actually to hear from God, which is what reading the Bible is all about more or less. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And so statistically speaking, you sort of think, well, surely to goodness then if we think about this church in Sardis, and as you know, I always like to try to get very practical about what I teach. If we think about this church in Sardis, we think about it in the context. Whenever we read those verses, we think, ah, oh, they don't apply to me, right? Because I ain't dead. But whenever we actually get into the reality of what it is we're reading, you start to think, hold on a minute. Let's not be complacent. Let's not be arrogant. Let's think that scripture is written for us and not for the person sitting beside us, all right? Let's see it in terms of us and so Jesus says, your deeds are unfinished in the sight of God. Now, this is interesting. Because God said, I know your deeds. Okay, so they did deeds. Okay, I know your deeds, but they are unfinished in my sight. Some good things, providing social needs. Already sort of hinted at this. People might get help on a practical level. Good deeds at this time of the year. But Jesus says those deeds are unfinished. Now, 
just want to look at that just for a second. Because there's a big push these days, massive push across the Western world about social action in church. I don't have an issue with the fact that we help people. It's clear in scripture that the disciples and the churches were set up initially to help the orphans and the widows. I have no issue with that concept. And so a few years ago, whenever I was doing my studies, one of the things that I studied was this whole thing about actually actually studied the growth of Pentecostalism in North America and its link to social action. And I asked the question, was it time to redress the balance with evangelistic mission? In other words, proclamation. In other words, telling people. Because if you go back to history, and some people may know some of these things, Francis of Assisi, for example, said, at all times preach the gospel and if necessary use words. Now, you'll hear that quoted. You may have already heard that at some point in your life. I don't agree with old Francis. I agree with the concept of what he was saying. Yes, we need to help people. But what he was actually saying was that we don't actually need to proclaim Christ. We show Christ. But I actually suggest that we need to do both. Because Bunky says that a gospel that is not proclaimed is no gospel at all. And whenever you get into scripture, you will see clearly whenever it says, Go ye into all the world and preach or proclaim the good news or gospel of Jesus Christ. It is clear what it is that we have to do. And so the deeds and the conclusion, you might wonder the conclusion that my 20,000 words eventually got to was, yes, church has grown massively, I believe, in the West linked to social action. But equally, as I'm sure you would expect from the words that you've already heard me saying there, is that my recommendation and conclusion was that actually we need to get back to proclamation. We need to get back to that balance, that healthy balance. And so whenever I look at verses like this in scripture, I look at that healthy balance because this is what I believe Jesus is saying. He's saying, yes, I recognize your deeds, but your deeds are unfinished. So the deeds were good. You have a good reputation. You're doing good things. They're really, really important, but you have to actually carry that through into proclamation you have to carry that through so that your deeds are finished so that you're reaching this world that we live in so that you're standing up for what it is that we believe that the bible says about things because jesus then says remember what you have received and heard and hold it fast so go look back Look back at what you heard at first. Look back at what it was that you experienced whenever you first came to Christ. What did you receive from God? Hold on to that. Hold it close. Hold it near. Rediscover it. Recommit. Rededicate. And again, whenever I was thinking about this as well this week, I sort of thought as maybe many in this room like me became... Christian at a very, very young age. And the Bible does talk about those who are forgiven little, love little. And there's a, for me, there's a real relevance in that because it's difficult to understand maybe where you've come from if you haven't came too far from anywhere, if that makes sense, with what has been going on in our lives. And I suppose for people who have been involved in church their entire lives, it's a difficult thing to discover sometimes. But the answer to that is actually the more you get into the word of God and the more you recognize who you are in light of God, actually that right there starts to increase your love for God because perfect love drives out fear. And that only will come through relationship. And so Jesus is saying, I know your reputation. I know it's good. I know that people see that, but your deeds in my sight are unfinished. You need to waken up. You need to repent of that because he says it's time to turn around. It's time to repent of that and be forgiven. And repentance is a word in scripture that we often use, but repentance actually means turning away from something. Repentance is turning around 180 degrees away from what it is that we're pursuing. It's not just a concept of saying, God, forgive me. That's important. But it's actually more than that and it's the practical application of saying I'm going to turn completely away from what it is that isn't good in my life. I'm going to turn away from just providing those good deeds. I'm going to turn away from not proclaiming. I'm going to turn away from not reading my Bible. I'm going to turn away from not praying and so on and so forth. And you see what it is that Jesus is saying. It's a very practical thing because sometimes we look too theologically at scripture Whenever Jesus is actually given us a very, very practical lesson. And he gives us a warning. He says that if you do not wake up, 
I will come like a thief and you will not know when. And I suppose, is it possible that this is like the second coming? Is it possible, and I'm only asking that as a question, is it possible that Jesus is saying, you're going to be lost? Now we're getting into a whole theological debate there that I'm not prepared to look at here this morning. But I'm leaning towards saying, yeah, actually, your light could be snuffed out. It is possible because why else? In my view, would Jesus be teaching this? Why would he say, actually, you're dead? You need to waken up. You need to turn away from that. You need to repent of what it is that you're currently not doing. And so then, Jesus then looks at the commendation. And he says, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever is ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And there were those in this church who had kept true to him and who had not soiled their their clothes in that metaphoric sense. Whenever I was studying this and thinking about it, I thought, right, if this is a dead church per se, right, group, congregation, why did these people stay within the church? Why did they not set up a new church? Why did they not go to that new, set up that new lively church or whatever it is term you want to put on it? But then whenever I actually thought about actually what Jesus is saying, I'm going to suggest that in any church, we're going to have dead people. Any church, the liveliest of churches, the most, you know, the churches that are doing massive things and having great impact for God, it is very possible that there's dead people in that church. And so whenever I like think about Sardis then and think, well, why did those people not leave? Because actually Sardis is a picture of the church. And whenever we look at that and we get into, I suppose, the statistics of church because we look at churches and it's true for every church, I would imagine, that like 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. And it's not about having to go with people here, but I'm going to suggest that there are so many people involved in church because it's a good social club. It's a good place to go to meet new friends. Not having to go if that's what you want to do but there has to be more than that there has to be an eternal impact our deeds must be finished there has to be something more than just turning up and so whenever Jesus says there's people there and they're faithful and their clothes are not soiled their clothes are not marked in any way like these people who are are dead And people would have understood that reference very, very clearly because no one would have dreamt of going into worship in soiled clothes. Again, we're not talking about the actual clothes that people are wearing here because it's so easy in our wee country as well. We get so hung up on how we dress for church. Oh my goodness. You'll forgive me for sort of digressing here for a second, but this is something that frustrates a life out of me. And I have no issue if people want to wear suits to church. No issue with that as long as they don't have an issue with me without a tie on. And I, I have to say whenever I was growing up, I used to get so frustrated that we could, we had to wear a tie on a Sunday, but we could get away with a shirt on a Wednesday. And I just, I, even as a young person, I couldn't quite work out where that came from. And it, you might be laughing and sniggering, but it's amazing how many people are going to hell because they wore jeans on a platform. And I'm being sarcastic now. I'm just trying to waken you all up in the real sense here this morning. But I've been in churches in Africa where they, where they don't have anything. Yeah. And they're wearing what they've got. And I never ever heard anyone turn around and say, oh, you need to get some new clothes before you can become a Christian. But in this country, <laughs> some people need to get a new clothes before they become a Christian. Yeah. And I look back, and one of the other things that I studied whenever I was at college, and forgive me if you're offended by what I've just said, but I remember whenever I was studying also whenever I was at Bible college, and I studied a thing thing called contextualization. You may have heard of it, you may not have heard of it, but it's the idea that if you go back to sort of the 30s and 40s, and you look at churches in Africa, and the churches in Africa were made out of wood, but they had spires. Simple thing. 
and the ministers were standing in three-piece suits. And you sort of think, hold on a minute. That, the, the idea there was that you need to build a spire and wear a suit before you can actually become a Christian. Think about the reality of it because that is actually what was being taught without it actually being taught. And I studied actually, I know I always do go off on a wee bit of a digress, hopefully you'll forgive me. I studied the whole idea of Christianity in Papua New Guinea and how the churches went in there and the whole potential idea, and I need to be careful because people's hearts would have been very positive. And obviously I'm not having to go at missionaries and stuff like that there. But the idea was, look, you actually need, and this may not have been the motivation, but this is what the outcome was. You need to become Western Christianity before you can become a Christian. You take somebody in their culture and tell them that you have to do X, Y, and Z before you can become a Christian, and they'll just not get it. They won't understand it because it's a cultural thing. And that's what, when we talk about certain dress sense that we apply, Right? And we all can laugh about it, but you've all been involved in church long enough to realize what I'm saying is true here, right? And I'm not having a go at anybody. I'm just saying that actually we need to get beyond cultural, yeah, setups. And the contextualization is that we can't take Christianity to a world in a concept that is understood without watering down what the truth of Scripture is. That's the balance. Okay, so whenever we take something to the world, we take it to the world in a way that they understand. But we never shy away from the truth of Scripture because that's the finished deed. Okay, you with me now? Because the unfinished deed is actually taking social action to the world and stopping short of telling them the truth of Scripture. Stopping short of saying, here's what the Bible says about this subject. Stopping short of, here's what the Bible says about that. Do you understand where I am with this? And it's amazing, actually, if you think about what's going on here, that is what I believe is being said within the context of these verses. And you go to parts of even our country today and expect people to buy a suit before they come to church. Think about the reality of it. And again, I want to point out, no issue if you wear a suit in church. It's not what it's about. Yeah? Now, I don't think that I should wear a belly top in church either. <laughs> Just like to point that out. Because that would be indecent. All right? And so there's different concepts that we're looking at here. And don't worry. When I come next month, I will not be wearing a belly top. All right? And so Jesus said... That they will walk with me dressed in white. Psalm 51 7 says that cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. It's a concept, yeah? Rather than an actual wearing off. Revelation 7 9. After, and this is, I love this. Love this, by the way. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb and they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Now we don't understand exactly what that means but the significance of that is that these were people who were washed in the blood of Jesus Christ wearing whether it's actual white robes or it's just the appearance of white robes but it's the indication that they were not dead the indication that they were standing before the throne of god from every nation love that word every in there every nation tribe people and language and they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands why did these people stay in the dead church i've answered it because Potentially, all our churches can be like that. And these people may have stayed because they didn't recognize maybe some of the other people who were dead. Or they misunderstood the reputation of some of the people within their congregations as well. And verse 5 tells us, as we finish this morning, that the one who is victorious will be like them, and their name will not be blotted out of the book of life. Jesus said he will acknowledge your name before his father and the angels if we confess him before others. And I suppose the question today, two questions. One, first of all, is your name in that book? Is it possible that it isn't? Um, 
I was speaking at a, a conference last weekend and I believed, and everybody was a believer there, I believe, but I threw out this net for people who maybe felt that they weren't where they should have been and it was a surprising response, a positive surprising response. And it was, it was as I was sitting here thinking about what we were going to talk about this morning, I thought, you know what, I want to give people that same opportunity here this morning. First and foremost, if there's someone here this morning who has never known Jesus as their own impersonal saviour, I want to give you that opportunity right now just to acknowledge that. Put your hand up and tell me that you've never been saved and that you want to get saved. And I'm not even going to ask for heads bowed here, all right, because we confess before we we confess God before others. He'll confess Jesus will confess us but before his Father in heaven. I suspect that everybody does know Jesus here. The second question is, is it possible that we have a reputation for being alive, but maybe our light's starting to ebb a little bit? That our deeds are unfinished? That maybe we've got to that place where we're not having that daily communion with God? That relationship building with him? Are we cold? And if that is the case, does anybody want to recommit, rededicate their lives to Jesus here this morning? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. This is what makes teaching the Word of God worth it, you know? It really does. Wow. I just love teaching the Word of God when there's a response. Anybody else feel that their hearts are cold? This morning and want to respond. I'm going to pray for those who have responded in a second. You know, last weekend, whenever I was away, and it was it was, as you remember, when I was here four weeks ago, uh, I could barely walk that day. If you remember, with my back, and I, I don't usually talk too much about what it is, where I go, and what I do. But last weekend, I was speaking at a conference in Canada, and the traveling was tough because of my back. And whenever we cast out that net last Sunday morning, and I was speaking about the river of God last Sunday morning. I was just thinking about that this morning as you started singing about it. And we, I threw out this second net and the response, and I just thought, oh, my God. And I mean that in such a positive way. I thought all the pain of getting to this location has been worth it. When I arrived, it was minus 14 but we'll not go there. And there's two people here, at least this morning, that has responded to this. And so that makes it all worth it, doesn't it? And uh, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Uh, let's all pray, but I'm going to pray. And uh, you guys know what you need to do. And you can talk to some of the leaders that are here. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for every sentence in it. Lord, we thank you that we can learn so much from it. And Lord, we thank you for the reality of it, Lord God. It's not old words on old pages that mean old stuffy things. Lord, there's a reality in every sentence in Scripture. And Lord, I know that it is possible for each of us to ebb and flow at times. Lord, I know that it is possible for each of us to grow cold at times. And Lord, it's easy in the busyness and the bustle of life to forget about you sometimes, Lord God. But yet we have that relationship with you. And Lord, I just thank you for the two people that have indicated here this morning that they want to recommit and rededicate their lives to you, Lord God. And for those who maybe were thinking this way this morning and didn't indicate, that doesn't matter either, Lord God. And I just pray, Lord, for the two that have indicated and for those that maybe are thinking it. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you will pour in a special blessing and anointing of the Holy Spirit of God this morning, Lord God. And that everybody within these four walls will be completely motivated to finish our deeds before you, Lord God in the way that you would want. 
and that everybody within these four walls will be motivated to develop our relationship with you, Lord God, in every way that you have laid out in Scripture, that we would have such a love for you and such a love for the Word of God that we cannot exist without it, that we are desperate for it, Lord God. And Lord, that each and every day we would not leave our houses before we pray and speak to you, Lord God. Even if that's just a few minutes, Lord God, but that we can talk to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I'm very happy this morning. I'm very happy.